be doing is what's supposed to be happening. All right. Okay. So welcome, bienvenue tout le monde. Um, today we have a very special guest on our page, uh, one of our very own from Ottawa Public Health. So before I give her a brief introduction, I'll just lay out um, kind of what to expect for the presentation today. So um, as you know, we're talking about infant feeding. And uh, you can, as the audience or listener, ask questions. So please feel free to post your questions in the comments section. We would love to hear from you. Uh, si vous voulez uh, poster vos questions en français, that is great. On va répondre en français. Uh, nous avons aussi des informations sur notre page Être parent à Ottawa uniquement en français. Uh, today's presentation will be in English only, uh, but we do welcome French commentary and French questions. So this is great. So I'm Katie. I'm a public health nurse and I am part of the Parenting in Ottawa team. I'm happy to be here with you today. And today we have Joanne Mitchell, uh, our beloved Joanne Mitchell, and she's a registered nurse and an international board certified lactation consultant. A very long and fancy way to say that she helps uh, parents in our community with breast and chest feeding and many other things as well. So uh, she's been helping new parents in Ottawa for over 15 years. She has a plethora, much experience in this department. And she's going to be talking about uh, all things infant feeding today. So like I said, um, we have information available in French on our French page. And uh, please post your questions in the comment section. Um, and I will make sure that I get to those as 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 many as possible. Okay, so Joanne, if you're there, if you can come off mute and off on camera, that would be great. Hello. Hi, Katie. Thank Hello. you so much for that introduction. Okay, I'll let you take off then, Joanne, and um, just let me know when you want me to change the slides, okay? Sounds great. Thank you so much. So hi, everybody. So today we're going to talk about um, infant feeding, which is, of course, a gigantic, huge topic. Um, so we're going to focus on a few specifics. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, prenatal support, latch and positions, timing and frequency of feeds, introduction of bottles and bo uh, paste bottle feeding, pumping, and how to know when things are going well and where to get help if you need it. So first off, um, when you're planning to breastfeed or chest feeding, um, one of the best things you can do is learn about breastfeeding and chest feeding prenatally. We have both parenting classes, um, prenatal parenting classes and pregnancy circles in Ottawa. Um, some are run by Ottawa Public Health, others are run by uh, some of the community centers. There's a list on our Parenting in Ottawa um, webpage about where to get information uh, about prenatal classes. There's also a link to some breastfeeding videos that have been prepared by the Region of Waterloo Public Health, which are absolutely amazing. They're quick, short little videos and they give you tons of information um, about breast and chest feeding. So those are good resources to review even before you uh, start um, breast or chest feeding. And another thing which is a great idea is when you're in the hospital and baby's just been born, ask to see the lactation consultant in the hospital to get off to a really good start. Um, so we'll move on to latch. So this first slide we have here is a picture of a baby with an asymmetric latch. So when we talk about latch um, and an asymmetric latch is that the latch is not centered. So if you look at this baby in the picture here, there more of the lower part of the areola is in the baby's mouth than at the top. So to get an asymmetric latch, um, have your baby in a good breastfeeding position, tickle the top lip of the baby with the nipple, and then bring the uh, chin and lower lip of the baby closest to the breast first. When the baby opens their mouth really wide in a big yawn, then you can help the baby move quickly onto the breast. So when you see an asymmetric latch, you'll see that more of the areola is at the bottom is in the baby's mouth, and the nipple is near the top of the mouth. So when top of the lip, um, baby's lips are, we say phalange, so they're open uh, out, out like this. So they're, uh, they're outward at the top and outward on the bottom to show us that baby uh, has a good wide open, open mouth there. When baby is latching well, you will see that their lips are rolled out, their nose and chin are touching the breast and their whole jaw will move. 
often when you're reading stuff on on um, online and stuff, you'll see that it says that the whole areola is supposed to be in the baby's mouth. Well, that to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. First, that's not an asymmetric latch. And secondly, babies and areolas are not all the same size, right? So if you have a baby with a small mouth and a mom with a huge areola, there is no way that baby can get all that in there. So more important is just to think about having that asymmetric latch and having as much of the areola in the baby's mouth as possible. When a baby has a good latch, you'll see the nipples not centered. Like I say, you'll see the lips out, you'll see the chin touching the, the breast, nose touching the breast, and the whole jaw will move. So if you're watching a baby who's got a big wide latch, you'll almost see their little ear will wiggle with each, um, with each suck. You shouldn't hear any noises besides kind of like a like a caw sound when baby swallows it's just kind of like a little like a little glug not a big glug you'll hear a little glug and that's all you should hear you shouldn't hear any clicking you shouldn't hear any uh baby shouldn't be fussing baby should be calm and quiet at the breast persistent pain and clicking sounds can be signs of an incorrect latch so if you do hear those remove the baby and try again and get baby back to latching again so breastfeeding should not be painful. It's fair that it's a little bit uncomfortable at first because quite honestly, nobody's nipples have had that much stimulation. So you're gonna feel a little bit of discomfort, but it shouldn't be painful. If it's painful, then that means that the latch is not quite appropriate and there's nipple damage that's occurring. So if you feel pain, remove baby and relatch. Um, so I also wanted to discuss the difference between nutritive sucking and non-nutritive sucking. So when a baby is sucking and swallowing, we'll see they've got the good latch. You'll see that movement all the way up to their ear with their whole jaw going. Um, and you'll hear that little caw, like a little glug sound. So they'll suck, 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 glug, suck, 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 glug, suck, 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 glug. So that shows us that baby's getting good milk transfer, has a good latch, is sucking and swallowing. So that's called nutritive sucking. So baby is sucking to get nutrition and is sucking to eat. Babies also do something called non-nutritive sucking and that's just comfort sucking. So they do that because babies love to suck, right? And what's a better place to be than on a breast or a chest that is smells delicious, it's comfy, cozy, they love it there. So babies will eat with their nutritive suck, and then they'll switch to non-nutritive sucking. You can tell the difference when the, when the um, latch becomes shallower, they'll slow down their speed. You won't hear that caw sound and they're just hanging on there. They're just sucking because they want to. So at that time, it's okay to remove baby from the breast. So there's studies that show that prolonged comfort sucking can actually lead to a lower milk supply and poor weight gain. So we want to make sure we're feeding our babies when they're hungry, when they're nutritive sucking, and not just allow them to sit and, and you know, use you as a human pacifier, um, because that's not always the greatest for both nipple damage, milk supply, and weight gain for babies. So can we switch to the next slide, please? So this is called baby led latching. And this is where mom will hold baby uh, tummy to tummy, skin to skin against their body. And baby will move their head and they'll find their way to the nipple rather than the other previous picture that I showed you where mom was leading baby to where, where the nipple was and, and holding in specific positions. So a newborn put on the, on the stomach of the breastfeeding parent, will they'll bob their head around and they will find uh, the breast, the nipple, and they will latch on their own. Um, so that gives baby a little bit more control over where they are, how they're latching. And it, it's actually really cool to watch that they just instinctively know how to, how to do that. So that's that position for baby led latching. Um, can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about some breastfeeding positions. So you can breastfeed your baby in whatever position you want. So these are just some ideas. They're certainly not the way you have to breastfeed. When we see stuff online, we read books and stuff, it tells you the classic breastfeeding positions, right? Like cross cradle, um, uh, football, all the lie side lying, like all the different specific prescribed positions, but that's not necessary. So all the things 
that you read about with positions are basically ideas, just giving you some guidance. The things that you need to remember for a breastfeeding position is that baby and you should both be well supported. So either baby is held on your arm, you're sitting in a chair that's comfortable, um, lying on your bed, whatever. Your mom is supported, baby is supported either by pillows or your arm. Um, baby is unswaddled, so not wrapped up in a blanket. Um, mom and baby skin touching is absolutely ideal. So baby should be tucked in close, tummy to tummy with the breastfeeding parent. So however that works is fine. So babies shouldn't be lying on flat on their back to eat. Um, they shouldn't be uh, on their back with their head turned to the side. So they should be all in a row. So head, chest, hips all in line, or you think ear, shoulder, hip also all in line. So the baby is all straight, not twisted to one side, because if you do it yourself, turn your head to the side and try to swallow, it's really hard to do. So babies can't do that either. Um, sometimes babies are fed curled up in a little fetal position. Again, it's hard to swallow if you've got your chin down. So all in a row, so sitting up straight. However that works for you and your baby is completely fine. So you can see in this little picture here, the, the top uh, left there, that mom's feeding in a side lying position. So baby and mom are both lying on the bed. That's an awesome position for um, moms who've had a C-section because you don't have babies sitting on your, on your uh, incision there. And you can have, just adjust the height of baby or breast depending on the size with pillows or whatever. Um, the one on the right there, upper right, that's sort of a laid back breastfeeding position. So mom is reclined in a chair and baby is lying up on, um, on, her, on her belly face to face. That's a great position as well for babies that are having trouble with, um, with a, a large milk ejection reflex and they're sputtering and coughing because mom's milk comes out so fast. So that's a great one for that. And it's easy and relaxing. Also for a C-section, you can move baby over to the side. And the bottom one is uh, a cross cradle hold where mom is holding uh, the baby in one hand and manipulating her breast to ensure she has a good latch in another hand. All of the breastfeeding positions that you see are not going to work for all moms. So a mom that has really large breasts with a very tiny baby will not be feeding in the same way as a tiny, tiny baby with or a, a small breasted person with a big baby, right? So you can look at all the positions that you can see pictures of and they're not all going to work. So it's just kind of try it and see as long as the baby is all in a row, right? Because if baby is in a row, mommy is tummy to tummy, that works. Um, so just keep those in mind. So whatever positions work for you, it's all good as long as baby is in a, in a row. Um, when you're feeding, it's to help the milk flow a little bit, you can um, hold the breast with fingers on one side, thumb on the other, kind of like this, and just do a little squeeze when to, to add just a little bit of breast compression when baby is uh, slowing down, just to help get that last little bit of milk out. It should not be uncomfortable. I've seen moms that have bruising on their breasts from doing such vigorous breast compression. So just soft and gentle, if it helps to baby get a little bit more milk, um, and just do that until baby's no longer sucking and then baby's done, right? So there we have a little bit of information about positions. And again, there's position pictures of positions on our, on our Parenting in Ottawa website. And um, those videos that I mentioned at the beginning have a really good little short video about different breastfeeding positions as well. Um, another one that's kind of funny is if you, if you just Google uh, breastfeeding yoga mom, there's a picture of a mom who's doing a headstand and her little one, six, seven month old is actually sitting in front of her breastfeeding while she's upside down in a handstand. So babies don't need to be in these fancy positions for breastfeeding, whatever works, works. Um, okay, so timing and frequency of feed. So I get a lot, a lot of questions about, about the timing and the frequency of feeds. So timing of feeds should be, we call it ad lib demand. So that means that you feed them as much as they want, whenever they want, right? So following feeding cues. So all babies will let you know that they're hungry. And their feeding cues are usually a bunch of similar things. So their eyes will move back and forth in their heads really quick. They'll start wiggling and stretching and moving their arms and legs. They'll bring their hands to their mouths, <clears throat> stick out their tongue, licking their lips, um, making little sucking noises. 
um, rooting. So they'll open their mouth, they'll look to suck on something like your arm or your cheek or whatever they can get their little lips on. Um, they turn the head back and forth and they start to make little sounds. So those are all signs that a baby is hungry. All babies will show a combination of these uh, signs, cues that they want to eat. Crying is a really late sign of hunger. So best to get to your baby before they're crying and uh, feed them when they're just showing these, these early cues. A baby that's crying for food, they're not usually super patient, especially for a breastfeeding baby. They don't generally wanna wait until, you know, mommy's got her stuff together and is ready to feed or for a bottle fed baby, they don't wanna wait until that food is warmed up. They're just gonna be screaming their head off until it's ready. But if you get them at those early feeding signs, then they're a little bit more, they're a little easier to get, to get going and get them fed. Um, a screaming, crying, angry baby, they're not very cooperative. So watch for those feeding cues and, um, and get your food ready when, uh, when, the, when you see those first cues, not wait for cry. So the timing and length of feeds, it depends baby to baby to baby to baby. So I hear often, well, babies are supposed to feed eight times in 24 hours. So they feed about every three hours. And that is occasionally true, but really not very often. We also hear stuff like, oh, a, a baby should, you know, finish their feed. They should feed for five to seven minutes. They should feed for 10 to 15. They should, again, it doesn't matter. Throw that all out the window. So when babies are first born, they will generally feed a minimum of eight times in 24 hours. Most babies will feed 10 to 12 times or more in 24 hours in their first little while. They will eat whenever they're hungry. Some babies will want, they'll show you those feeding cues every hour, every hour and a half. And that's what they need. So feed them every time they want to. Just because they fed an hour ago doesn't mean they're not hungry again. It doesn't mean they're just sucking for um, non-nutritive sucking. They're, they are likely hungry again. If you're seeing all of those feeding cues, they likely need more food. So the length of the feed depends on the baby. And that's just it, they're just like us, right? Like sometimes you want to just linger over your lunch and take your time and you just, you know, eat it real slow. And other times like, you know, get in, get out and go home and just nom, 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 shovel it in. Babies are the same. So sometimes they'll take five to seven minutes to finish their bottle or breastfeeding session. Other times they may be 25 minutes and that is all okay. It doesn't mean that the short feed was bad and the long feed was good or vice versa. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that baby felt like taking it easy that time and didn't want to eat real fast. And that's totally fine. So if your baby has a good latch, if they're actively sucking and swallowing, they can eat as long as they want. If they're starting to move into that non-nutritive sucking where, you know, it's just sort of a little bit mouthing, really quiet in between, taking a lot of time between swallows, then they're probably done. And then they're just hanging out. So you will always have milk, right? So baby will eat and eat and eat and eat. And it's not like the breast is like a, I don't know, water bottle or something it's not it doesn't ever empty and then fill up again you're always making milk especially when baby's sucking so um, there's always going to be something there for the baby to eat so that's when we want to make sure you know they're not doing that non-nutritive sucking and just hanging out there forever and causing nipple damage and everything else um, so if you're breastfeeding <clears throat> feed baby from the first breast when baby's finished and satisfied slow down take them off give them a burp try them on the second side they may take it for two minutes or not at all um, but then just start them on that breast for the next feed so that you make sure that you are evenly feeding. Um, yeah, so again, the timing, it may not be, it may not be the same every time. It may be different at every feed during the day. It'll be, certainly be different day to day and as babies grow. In the first few weeks of, um, of feedings, like I say, it's a minimum of eight times in 24 hours. In the first, until they're back to their birth weight, we like uh, parents to wake their babies at least every three hours to feed them every three hours until they're back to their birth weight. Once they're back to their birth weight, then we can really just let baby decide when they want to eat. But it is important that they do get back to their birth weight. We like them to be back to their birth weight by two weeks of age. So in those first two weeks, until they're back to birth weight, do feed them and wait there to wake to feed them every three hours. Um, at an absolute minimum. Nighttime feeds are really important as well. So we're often quick to um, want babies to sleep through the night, which is fair enough. I like sleeping at night. Um, 
but those feeds are pretty important for babies to have. If they go too long between feeds at night, it can impact their, their growing. It can certainly impact mom's milk supply of breastfeeding. Um, so most babies, I think it's just important to keep in mind that most babies won't sleep for more than five hours until they're about six months old. Some, some do, but that's not the norm. So we often hear, oh, well, my baby's three months old. Why aren't they sleeping through the night? My friend's baby is. It, that's not usual for a three-month-old baby to sleep through the night. They're usually up at night at least every five hours until they're six months old. So, you know, sometimes people will say, oh yeah, my baby sleeps through the night, but they're going to sleep at midnight and they're waking up at five. So again, yeah, they're sleeping for a five hour stretch, but that's not necessarily everybody's definition of sleeping through the night. So just to keep that in mind, those night feeds are pretty important and they will go on for quite a long time. Um, most babies will have um, periods of time in the day that they are super hungry and they'll cluster feed. So that means that they have a whole bunch of short feeds over a few hours of time. Often it's in the evening, but it can be any time of day. So that's a time that's often frustrating for parents because you feel like, oh my God, I just fed that kid and it wants to eat again. Like I don't have enough milk. I'm doing something wrong. Why are they hungry all the time? It's normal. That's just normal infant behavior. And babies sometimes eat a lot. So don't worry about it. Follow those feeding cues and just feed them as much as they want to eat whenever they want to eat it. So um, yeah, so often I'll find um, with moms that I'm working with that are breastfeeding that uh, they'll hear from other people. Oh, well, no, I, I don't have enough milk because my baby wants to eat every hour and a half. So I'm starting to give formula in the evening because they, they um, I, I'm not satisfying them. But that's not necessary, not at all. Your body will match what your baby needs. So just keep feeding as much as your baby wants to eat. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's sort of the frequency of feeds. So just to keep in mind, newborns eat a ton. And there's no rhyme or reason. There's no actual, you know, guide of what they should be doing when. They just do what they want to do. And that's all okay. I do want to bring up the fact that in the hospital, you are told Babies need to be fed uh, 15 minutes aside every three hours. And that is absolutely true while they're in the hospital. So most moms will hear that information in the hospital and then they go home and they're like, what? The nurse told me that I can just feed as long or as little as the baby wants. It doesn't make any sense. That feeding for 15 minutes aside every three hours in the hospital is to make sure that your milk comes in. So the more you breastfeed, the more milk you make, right? So if moms are not feeding or pumping in the hospital, then they're not going to have milk coming in when they get home. So that's why the hospitals tell you feed or pump every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes, sorry, <laughs> every three hours for at least 15 minutes aside. So that's the reasoning behind that information, but it changes as soon as you go home, right? So just to keep that in the back of your mind. So I do want to talk about um, bottle feeding, um, introducing bottles and um, paced bottle feeding. So <clears throat> paste bottle feeding is something that we've sort of been talking about for the last 10 years or so, I'd say. Um, before that, it was just kind of like fulfill the bottle, stick it in the baby's mouth and they'll, and they'll eat and you don't need to worry about it. And we found that babies will actually bottle feed much, much better if we allow them a little more control over the pace of the bottle. Um, when a baby breastfeeds, they have pretty much control over how much milk they get, right? Because they suck and it comes out faster. They don't it doesn't whereas bottle feeding it will continually drip into their mouth so they don't have as much ability to pace themselves so when we use a, a paste bottle feeding technique it really gives babies a little bit more control over over what's happening with them um, so the way a baby sucks on a bottle is very different from the way a baby sucks at a breast um, so we're trying to make these two things match a little bit better um, if your goal is to be exclusively breastfeeding, giving bottles too early can interfere with, um, with breastfeeding just because of the different uh, technique used to bottle feed as to breastfeed. Um, doesn't mean that no baby who's breastfeeding can ever have a bottle. It just keep in mind that it is a different mechanism and it can affect uh, how they breastfeed. So <clears throat> when you're bottle feeding, when you're doing a paste bottle feeding, best bet is to get one of the bottles that has a big wide, the bigger, the bigger mouth to bottles and has a, uh, the big wide nipple, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, and a slower flow. So bottles, sorry, just a sec. 
there are a thousand different kinds of bottles out there and just as many different kinds of nipples you can buy. Most of it is marketing. If you buy a low, slow, wide-based nipple, you're going to do okay with a baby's bottle feeding. Um, you can buy them by age and stage and flow. There's a whole bunch of different things. Honestly, the majority are fairly similar, but the best is wide-based and slow flow. So keep those, keep that in mind if, when you're looking in uh, the stores for all the different kinds of bottles. So just like uh, latching a breastfeeding baby, take the bottle and touch it to your baby's upper lip until they open their mouth wide. And then let the baby move on to the nipple as opposed to just shoving the nipple in the baby's mouth. So then the baby has control over grasping of the nipple as well. Um, hold the bottle horizontal and let the baby close their mouth on the, on the bottle. So when the baby is initially uh, starting with the bottle, there should not be milk in the whole entire nipple part. So a nipple is made to mimic a breast in that it has a nipple and it has a areola. So when you're first putting the bottle into the baby's mouth, have the nipple have milk in it and the areola part, like the wider part, not be full of milk. So that should only be about half full. When it's partially full, your baby can um, control the flow a little bit better. And, and um, you're not feeding them straight air because there's milk in there, like the, in the hole in the nipple, the, there is milk where the hole of the nipple is, but the rest of it uh, has some air in it. So if you look sort of like half, if the bottle's horizontal and the nipple's half full of milk, then that's good. Um, we often tend to feed, bottle feed babies more in a sitting position with the bottle, uh, like, like at an angle like this pointing down. And that's a lot of flow for a baby. So if you can lie baby back a little bit, feed them more in like a breastfeeding bottling position, um, with the bottle horizontal, baby will get a little bit uh, more control over, over their feeding. Um, if they get tense or they start gulping, slow the feed down and let them get used to it again and then st start going again. So that's sort of a few ideas about paced bottle feeding, um, just, to, just to help babies be able to manage their, uh, their bottling a little bit better. Um, I also wanted to touch on pumping because there's a lot of um, mums that are starting to pump right away as soon as they're discharged from the hospital. I would encourage you to pump on the advice of an LC or a nurse or somebody who's been helping you with breastfeeding. Um, I have a lot of mums who are getting into a, a oversupply situation and, get, and having severe nipple damage from pumping. So, Pumping should be done with a quality grade pump um, every two to three hours, even overnight, if that's if you're pumping to build and maintain supply. Um, and make sure that the pump is set to be comfortable. So a comfortable suction and a comfortable fit, not as high suction as you can stand. So that sort of used to be the thing, like set it as high as you can as you can stand it that's gonna cause damage. If you're just, you know, <laughs> as high as it can go, you're gonna, you're gonna have nipple damage after that. So make sure it's comfortable, make sure that the, the pump fits well. Um, usually the pumps have lots of pictures uh, in with their sizing and stuff like that. So, you know, or consult an LC or the nurse at the hospital to make sure that the size of your pump works for you and pump for a max of 20 minutes. So more, more than that can uh, end up causing nipple damage. So, which we really want to avoid because it's hard to feed a baby when it's, you know, your toes curl as soon as you try to latch them because you're so uncomfortable. So um, yeah, so just keep that in mind about pumping. So comfortable and not, not as high as it needs to go and for as long as you can until you're getting no milk left because 20 minutes is the max. Okay, so we're gonna move on. We're, I see we've got the next slide up there already. Uh, signs that, oh, back one, please. <laughs> Thank you. So signs that feeding is going well. So as we know, we can't uh, measure how much a breastfeeding, chest feeding baby is getting. It, it, we have no idea what's going in. Uh, bottle feeding baby, yes, for sure we know what's going in. However, we need to maintain um, like a monitoring of their output and that's how we know that enough's going in because enough stuff's coming out. So babies usually lose weight in the first few days, which is absolutely normal. They usually get back to their birth weight by two weeks of age. Many are before that. And they should be gaining about 20 grams a day. So when, if you see on this little chart here, when babies are 
firstborn, they'll have wet diapers for how many days they are old. So one diaper on day one, two on day two, three on day three, and continuing on to there. And then after day five, they have about six wet diapers a day. So you know that your baby's getting enough in if they're having enough out. So say you have a three day old baby and you're not sure how much they're eating, you're not sure what's going on, but they have three heavy wet diapers and they have three poopy diapers, you're good to go, right? So, and they're gaining weight. So that's all we need to know. We don't need to worry about weighing them before and after feeds or anything like that. All we need to do is watch how much is coming out. So there's lots of apps that you can get on your phone or just a little tick sheet in those first couple of weeks while you're monitoring to see is, babe, is enough coming out. <laughs> so um, PE, like I say, is there by the, <clears throat> on the little chart for their poop. Um, they'll often have two or three uh, stools a day. Um, they start out being that thick black meconium that's like tar, and then it'll change to blackish green in the first few days. By day three or four, it's kind of brownish yellow. And then after day five, it's um, they're soft and yellow and seedy, kind of look like Dijon mustard. Um, so if they're gaining weight and they're peeing and pooping, we know they're doing okay. We know that enough is going in. Usually in the first few days after discharge, babies are weighed within 24 to 48 hours after being discharged home from the hospital. And then they're often weighed again at one week and two weeks by their family doctor, um, or the hospital will have a clinic that you go back to to get weighed. Um, there's also some places in the city where you can get your babies weighed um, at community health centers um, or um, breastfeeding supports that are run by Ottawa Public Health. So all that information as well is on our our um, Parenting in Ottawa website, and the, we'll add some information after about um, places where you can go, go to get help. So um, I think also, I just want you to look at that little uh, picture there of the size of baby's tummies. So you can see that it's a cherry and then a walnut and then an apricot and then an egg. So when they're first born, a cherry is not very big, right? So when we're thinking, and I see it more with babies that are being bottle fed than breastfed, because like I say, we don't know how much breast milk is going in. Um, babies will be given like an ounce, or like 30 milliliters of milk to drink. And then they're crying and they barf it all up. And their tummy is the size of a cherry. That's not 30 mils. Like 30 mils is the size of a golf ball. So that's way too much milk for a little belly to take. So keeping in mind the size of their tummy will give you a better idea sort of about how much food that they can actually hold because their little bellies are teeny teeny. That little stomach is so tiny when they're first born. So they don't need very much food at all. So if you don't have, aren't seeing these signs that feeding's going well. So for example, if um, you aren't getting the output that you are expecting, right? So there's not the right amount of urine, not the right amount of stool. If the urine is really, really dark in color and not pale yellow. Um, if baby's really, really sleepy and hard to wake for feeds um, and or falls asleep as soon as you get started on feeds, um, baby's crying and not settling after feeds, or your nipples are really, really sore and not getting better, um, or you have fever, chills, flu-like symptoms, um, painful area in the breast, any things like that, get help early. So go in the first 48 to 72 hours of your infant's birth just to get going to make sure that feeds are going well. Um, and like I say, we'll, we'll uh, post some places where that you can go to get help or look at our Parenting in Ottawa Facebook page under chest feeding, um, breastfeeding. There's links there for where you can get help with, uh, with monitoring weights and to find out what you can do to help your baby gain or help you with your breastfeeding, chest feeding if it's, if it's not going well. So that's kind of a lot of information really, really quick. And uh, I know that's a lot to take in, but um, I think we'll move along to any questions that anybody has. So we have time for just sort of a little, uh, a little chit chat session. Thank you so much, Joanne. That was awesome. And it really brought me back <laughs> to, my, to, to the days where I was nursing uh, breastfeeding my my two children and just like what a whirlwind it felt like in those early days <laughs> um, and you know both children both being very different one nursing more in the classic way of every three hours and then one every hour and a half around the clock 
So, you know, it's one of the things I wanted to mention was, <laughs> you know, you can't compare if you're having your first or second, they're both going to be different. They're both going to nurse differently and that's okay too, right? We have sort of these expectations that, oh, maybe you went this way for one, it'll be like that for the other. And then mm -hmm. they throw you a nice <laughs> curveball. Um, so somebody did have a question and they wanted to know what tips do you have for babies who become fussy during letdown? Right, that's an awesome question actually. Um, so what happens often when a baby becomes fussy during letdown, it's either one of two things, either the letdown is too slow for baby and they're just like, seriously, give this to me now, or letdown is too fast and baby's kind of like choking and gagging because it's all of a sudden they go from no milk to it shooting down their throat. So I'll give you sort of a little information about both those things. So a baby that is frustrated with the letdown and wants more to happen quicker, what moms can often do if it's a, you know, that seems to be the pattern is that baby wants food and wants it now, and it's not quite there, is that mom can do a little bit of breast massage, a little bit of hand expression prior to latching so that baby doesn't have to wait to, for letdown because doing the hand expression first will make that letdown occur so that it will, uh, baby doesn't have to wait because letdown's already happened. Um, so, there's some really good videos online about um, doing hand expression. And, you know, even just while you're getting, picking baby up from the, from the crib or wherever, or just getting them settled, taking off their outfit, just do a little bit of hand expression, do a little breast massage prior to latching. And then that baby will be like, oh yeah, okay, here it is. It's all good, I got it. Um, so that can sort of help with that. The flip side is an overactive letdown um, where the milk comes out really, really quick. So baby will latch. They'll go from zero to hundred and they are just like, whoa, I can't cope. So that one um, is, is really, you can help a lot that kind of a baby with positioning. So that laid back position that we saw um, several slides ago where mom is reclined in a chair, leaning back and baby is on top of mom. So baby's on mom's chest. So in that position, gravity is working for the baby, right? So if, if baby is fed with mom leaning forward, milk is just pouring out, right? Because of gravity. So if mom leans back, baby has to work a little bit harder to get that milk out. So that can be a really helpful position for a mom with sort of an overactive letdown. Um, and there's nothing, it, I don't like that term because it sounds like there's something wrong, right? It's an overactive letdown. It's just that it's faster than what baby likes, right? So it's not a big deal. But feeding in a reclined, mom reclined back, just in a reclining chair, pillows on a, on a bed, whatever works, um, that can really, really help with baby having a little bit more control about how much milk comes out and, and how fast it comes out. So there we've got both ends of the spectrum on that yes. one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's good that you addressed both possible sides of that. Um, okay, so my baby is starting to sleep for longer stretches at night. Do I need to wake them up to feed them? Perfect. Okay, so again, that will depend on how old baby is. So if baby is under the, that first two weeks and isn't back to birth weight, then yes, 100% baby has to be woken every three hours to feed overnight until they're back to birth weight. If baby is back to birth weight and trucking along just nicely and is happily sleeping for four or five, six hours, then just say thank you and let them sleep, right? So take advantage. If your baby wants to sleep at night, then you just sleep along right beside and, and, and enjoy. So absolutely not. But in those first two weeks, not up to birth weight, 100% wake them every three hours. Otherwise, let them sleep and enjoy the sleep time that you get. <laughs> If you can, yeah, if you can get it, take it. Mm, take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a bit of um, maybe a multi-layered question. And Joanne, you know, if you if you feel like maybe uh, you want to private message some of these uh, uh, audience members, completely let, let us know, no problem. But this one, this question, is it normal to have a reduced supply around six weeks postpartum or after a block duct, duct has been resolved? Um, and how can we increase the supply once it starts uh, after it's dropped? Right. So, yeah, so that's kind of a multifaceted question for sure. So a couple of things there. So at six weeks, often um, babies will have a big growth spur. There's a little bit of change in sleep patterns. That's a time that moms often feel, I don't have enough milk. My baby wants more than I have. 
but there it's okay. Like if you continue to breastfeed as much as you, as baby wants for as long as baby wants, like that ed low demand thing, supply should continue to match um, what baby needs. Like supply and demand should match. Often, like I say, often, often that's a time where moms are like, oh, I, I don't have enough. Baby's just eating all the time. I don't have enough milk. So all I can say is persevere, right? Like keep on feeding as much as you want. After a block duct, yes, often moms will say, I had a block duct, um, it has resolved, but my supply went down. When there's a block duct, moms are stressed, like fair enough, right? It hurts, it doesn't feel good. So so feeding parents are, are it, you know, stress goes along with supply. So, and often when that side is really sore, we're more reluctant to put baby on that side. You don't wanna keep them on as long because it doesn't feel as good. So it can definitely, uh, impact supply. So I would suggest continue to do, continue feeding, feed them on the blocked side first, so that that's the side that baby is feeding most vigorously on. Um, if you point baby's nose towards where the block is, that will actually help to get that block uh, loosened up quicker. Um, so if the block is say for example the block is that i don't know, think about your nipple as a clock is that two o'clock face the put the baby's nose sort of up at the two o'clock section and have their body going down down that way um, and that can help also massaging during feeds doing some breast compression during feeds can also help um, and always if you pump you can increase supply right so if you have the time and the energy to pump after a feed um, do so if that's just too exhausting. Try a couple of times a day after feeds to just do some hand expression just to get that extra stimulation to increase uh, the supply. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Joanne. Okay, so we'll we'll keep trucking through the the, the questions yeah, if no you're worries. okay with that. Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. So this question is: My baby refuses to drink pu my pumped breast milk. Um, what could be the reason? It's not a bottle related problem. Um, they've supplemented with formula and that was fine. So it seems to be an issue with the baby not wanting the breast milk out of the bottle. Mm. So can you speak to maybe the commonality of that or why that's happening or any advice that you have? <laughs> okay, so I've actually seen that quite a few times. So um, I used to work in the neonatal intensive care and we had a lot of babies that were just like, yeah, no, no I'm, not, I'm not wanting that stuff. Um, when breast milk has been frozen and thawed, often it, it changes the enzymes a little bit. And some of it will have a different smell, different taste to it after it's been frozen and thawed. And some babies are just like, yeah, no, that is not quality gear. I don't want that stuff. It's completely fine to feed the baby, but they will just be like, no, I don't want it. I only want fresh, fresh from the tap or nothing. There's honestly, you there's not a whole lot you can do besides making sure it's exactly the temperature of your body. <laughs> Um, hold baby for bottle feeding in the same position you would um, breastfeeding. Um, but, or what you can also do if, if, if it's a problem of like old, old versus fresh brand new milk is um, mix it half and half, right? So if you have older milk that's been thawed, frozen, or it's even just been in the fridge for a few days and they don't like that, pump a little bit of fresh and, and try to trick them by, by diluting the older milk with the newer milk and they that may be enough for them to just be like oh yeah this is good enough okay I'll take this stuff um yeah and it it's not a super common thing but the babies that I've seen that are like no I don't want that they are adamant that they don't want they want what they want and otherwise they're like yeah no I don't want that so you can try those things temperature mix it half and half um yeah there's not much you can do to trick a baby that's decided that that's what they want to do which is unfortunate because yeah the other thing is sometimes babies will grow out of that as well right they'll they'll think oh yeah no i'm not doing that and give them another couple of weeks and they might be yeah okay sure i'll try again so you can try it it does happen though <laughs> oh okay all right so how do you know joanne uh when your supply has regulated that was the question okay so meaning that you i so to me supply being regulated is that mom produces enough milk to keep baby satisfied within a 24-hour period so if you are able to feed your baby without giving a supplement of formula or um, previously pumped breast milk 
and just exclusively breastfeed throughout the day, baby has the appropriate number of wet diapers and poopy diapers and gains weight appropriately, then your milk would be regulated and you would have enough to feed that baby in a 24 hour period. Okay, yeah, that's sort of what I assumed the question. I, okay, I yeah. think that's what it was. And the commenter, <laughs> okay. feel free to uh, reframe that question if you would like, if we didn't quite hit the, the nail on the head there. So, yes, um, but I think that's, you know, when I mean, think about regu regulated, I do think, mm -hmm. yes, okay, when you know that you've had, your baby is sort of satisfied with what you're offering them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in that 24 hour period. Um, so in terms of support, obviously, lots of support for breastfeeding exists. But do you know, or are aware of supports that exist for parents who exclusively pump? Um, and what kind of, you know, if there is support available, what kind of would that look like? Do you think? Okay, so for me, as a lactation consultant, I think any person who is a lactation consultant should be equally supportive of a a pumping parent as opposed to a chest or breastfeeding parent. Um, I know any of the lactation consultants that anybody would see at any of the parenting in Ottawa um, breastfeeding support places would all offer the uh, support for that and lots of information um, about a pumping parent. There are many, 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 many parents who, who pump and bottle feed throughout their whole, you know, feeding experience right so like to me that is unreal to be able to pump and bottle and feed your baby for you know six nine months doing that is is astounding to me because that's like double duty right like that's double work pumping and then and then feeding express milk so yes and like I say any lactation consultant anybody should be able to um to help out with with any questions regarding that because that is uh it's a a very commendable way to feed. I could never, I don't think I could ever do that. But yeah, kudos to anybody who can. And yeah, so there's, there's, like I say, there's lots of support through, through Ottawa Public Health um, and our drop-ins for moms who are exclusively pumping and bottling. Yeah, it's, it's such a good point. And in terms of, you know, the moms that are doing triple feeding, uh, you know, that seems to be kind of happening mm -hmm. a lot these days. And maybe yes. you can explain a little bit what triple feeding means, but, you know, in order to what you're talking about the beginning, Joanne, for preparing <laughs> for, you know, childbirth and preparing for breastfeeding, there's not a lot of ways to really prepare yourself for breastfeeding, but to really just have information ready at your availability to know that there's support available, right? So it's like, like mm -hmm. you said, being in the hospital requesting to see a lactation consultant, that's something that you can ask for, right? Mm -hmm. And there's lactation consultants available through our baby helpline, which uh, we have, we can list at the end of this um, through one of our resource links. Um, so there is support available. And th I think the best way, the best thing to do is to just sort of arm yourself with that information of where you can get help. Um, okay, so that's perfect. So I don't have any more questions that have come in from audience members, Joanne. So I think that's uh, probably a good time to wrap it up. Um, but this was an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed just listening and kind of being brought back to that time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think if I have any sort of advice or anecdotal information for expecting parents is just go easy on yourself, give yourself grace. It's a tough period of time, um, but have support available to you, however that might look like. Um, and yeah, don't forget Ottawa Public Health is here to support you as well in this exciting and very confusing period of your life. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Joanne. And if there are more questions that come in through our audience, uh, through comments after, we will be happy to answer them. So please don't think that you have to stop asking questions now. Our page is staffed all by public health nurses. And if a question is too complicated, we'll pass it on to one of our specialists like Joanne. Um, and this live presentation will also be available on our page for days to come in case you missed it. So thank you very much, Joanne. And uh, hopefully we get to talk to you again, again soon. Thanks for having me. Yes. All right, I'm just stopping the live stream. Okay, perfect. <laughs> just give me one sec. <laughs> I'll just confirm that it's not playing, but I did stop it. Perfect. <sighs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs>
it went 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 really well. Okay, oh, so good. I'm glad. Did it stop? Just want to make sure. Yeah. So that was awesome. I. It's such a. It's such a like hard thing to even start talking about, right? Like you kind of land it. You. I think you started at a good spot when talking about the latch and breastfeeding positions, and then moving into all the different pieces and. Yeah, I can tell that you're like really passionate about it too. Like, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's all I talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's good, right? babies, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, Joanne. Um, do you have, and fun. if you have any feedback about uh, the presentation, like, or if you felt like you wanted more time to answer questions, let us know. But I think like 50 minutes is good. Um, yeah we don't want to like lose participation or audience attention because you know, there is a lot of information. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was awesome. It was really oh, nice that was, chatting that with you. That was really fun. <laughs> yeah. I hope we get to do that it again. Awesome. Yes, for sure. Okay. Awesome. Okay, have a great Thanks afternoon. So you Bye. too. Bye. Bye.